Well, greetings, everybody. With Bob Christopher and Richard Piper, I'm Bob Davis, and this is Basic Gospel, a media ministry dedicated to helping you hear, believe, and live the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, we continue on our study of the book of Hebrews, and we're glad that you're with us. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, you're ready. So are we. So here's Bob Christopher to get us rolling. Well, thanks, Bob. Chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews is one of my all-time favorite chapters. And uh, if I had a list of the top 10, probably four or five of that top 10 (laughs) would be out of the book of (laughs) Hebrews. This is such a marvelous book. And this particular chapter really uh, gives us some deep insight into the priesthood of Jesus Christ and into this new covenant that he has ushered in uh, through his death. Uh, So those are the two themes of the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ himself, and this new covenant. So God wants us to know for sure that Jesus Christ is his final word to man. There's no higher word. There's no greater word. There's no more uh, life-changing word than what we experience in Christ Jesus. And this word that Jesus has brought us is the word of the new covenant. So that's where we live today. We don't live under the old covenant. We live in the new covenant. So Hebrews 7 really talks about that. Now, Hebrews 7 is going to pick up uh, from a note in, in Hebrews chapter 5. So in Hebrews chapter 5, the writer is introducing Jesus as our great high priest. Yes. So he has done something on behalf of mankind Um, that no other priest could ever accomplish. And so he's starting to get into that uh, discussion, and then he steps back and he says, I have so much more to say about this. What? The priesthood of Jesus Christ. But you have become dull in your thinking. You need milk, not solid food. Um, So let's, let's kind of talk through that a little bit. I want you to know that I think great things about you, things that accompany salvation, and you have this hope of what Christ has done, the fact he's the forerunner, that he has entered in to the Holy of Holies on our behalf, and that hope becomes an anchor for the soul. So now that we have that established, the writer says, let's pick up on this conversation about Jesus Christ, our great high priest. So for this uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, uh, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So he introduces this character from the Old Testament, Melchizedek. Now, we meet Melchizedek in Genesis 14. Mm -hmm. And Abraham had gone out and he had defeated some kings. He had taken some spoils uh, from those kings And he was returning home, and on this journey back, Melchizedek just shows up. He's just he just appears out of out of nowhere, and he brings with him bread and wine, and he blesses Abraham. And in response to that, Abraham gives a ten percent of the spoils. Mm -hmm. Now that was customary back in those days. That was just the conventional thing to do. So Abraham was carrying out customs. And that's all we hear or read about as far as Melchizedek is concerned. Yeah. Until the writer of Hebrews brings that back into play. And now many people think that he brought that back into play to teach tithing, to show the importance of tithing. Well, this chapter, Hebrews chapter yeah. 7, is not the great tithing chapter of the New Covenant. That is simply a point, something that the writer is using to show that Jesus Christ is after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a type, was a foreshadowing of this Jesus that was to come. And in being after that uh, that order, that he is superior 
to the Old Testament priest. That's all the writer is trying to say here. Jesus beats the Levitical priesthood hands down. Yes. And here's some of the things that we learn about Jesus in this um, description of Melchizedek. The fact that his name, uh, uh, by translation, is king of righteousness, that he is also the king of Salem, the king of peace. Well, who in the world is Jesus Christ? He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of peace. When we are justified uh, through faith in Jesus Christ, it says in Romans 5.1 that we are at peace with God. He is the prince of peace, the king of peace. That's Jesus Christ. And that's what he's mediated between God and man. That's what he's accomplished so that we can have peace with God and righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. So this description of Melchizedek gives us insight into who Jesus is and what he's accomplished for us also says that this Melchizedek was without father or mother. Now, we have no earthly idea uh, anything about Melchizedek. Yeah. As, he, as I said, he just showed up. And so, in essence, he just appeared out of nowhere. There was no genealogy that we could mm-hmm. trace to find out who he really belonged to. Uh, and so, as a type, that speaks to the eternalness of, of Jesus Christ, that that he is a priest forever. So Melchizedek resembled the Son of God, yes. who is a priest forever. So how great a man was this Melchizedek? And again, this is all going to be used by the writer of Hebrews to make this one point, that there's a new priest in town, his name is Jesus, he's the high priest, and there's no one superior to him. He trumps every priesthood that has ever been, including the Levitical priesthood. Well, you're listening to Basic Gospel, everybody, and this, of course, is week eight of our study through the book of Hebrews. And if you've joined us late or if you miss any of the live sessions of this particular study, you can catch up by accessing our program archive under the radio drop-down menu at basicgospel.net. Again, that's the uh, drop-down menu right under radio, and that's the first item on the list. You can uh, pick up there with the archive and uh, catch up with the studies or any time that you want. Uh, By the way, if you haven't yet tried this, uh, we'd love for you to join us each broadcast day as we stream live video of the program on both Facebook and YouTube. It's uh, your chance to come inside the studio with us here at Basic Gospel. Yes, indeed. So the next section is, uh, again, that comparison of Melchizedek, what happened with Melchizedek and Abraham, how that relates to to the Levites, and eventually makes the point that Jesus is superior based on a number of things. So, Richard, just briefly work us through that through that uh, section and bring us all the way down through verse 11 to tell us why this really matters, why this is important for us. And if you're listening today, this is this is the most important information, one of the biggest pieces of this Grace New Covenant puzzle that will connect the dots for you. And, and enable you to really embrace who you are in Jesus Christ and to live this life to its full. So walk us through that. Okay. Bring us all the way down through verse 11. Okay. So it says here in verse 4, Observe how great this man was to whom Abraham gave a tenth of the choice of spoils. If you, we've already talked about it, but if you go back to Genesis 14, if you realize that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth, paid off his own men a little bit, and gave all the rest of it back to the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham kept nothing. That's right. Absolutely Absolutely nothing. nothing. And so the the writer here seizes on that to say, look, Abraham was the, the man of promise, and out of Abraham came Levi and the sons of Levi. And so in the Mosaic Covenant, the sons of Levi, the tribe of Levi, those who served the priestly ministry, were designated to receive 10% from the people. 
because as we've talked about before, they did not have an inheritance of the land. Um, they, they didn't make a living, so to speak. The rest of the tribes supported them and, oh, by the way, supported the, the fatherless and the widows and, and that sort of thing. So the tribe of Levi was designated to do this, but Melchizedek, who was not Israeli, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him. Catch this logic. Clearly, the lesser person is blessed by the greater person. Okay? So Abraham, in essence, put himself in a lesser role under Melchizedek than Abraham had to. Right? Abraham submitted to Melchizedek. So Melchizedek the greater blessed Abraham the lesser. Therefore, since Levi was a descendant of Abraham, you could say that even Levi paid a tenth to Melchizedek. So Levi is less than Melchizedek. And so we've got this picture that if we're talking about Jesus and Melchizedek, something about Jesus must be greater. And here's the point where it turns in verse 11. If perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest? So the issue comes down to being perfection. Why this rather interesting argument? Because Abraham paid tithe to someone who shows up and goes away. We never see him again. Therefore, Abraham played the lesser role to the greater role played by Melchizedek. Levi was even less than that because he was a couple of generations removed even from Abraham. So something has to give, and it has to give because the law makes nothing perfect. That's exactly right, and we see that right in that in that particular pa- uh, passage and on down in verse 19, the law made nothing perfect. Yeah. And this word perfect is an interesting word. Mm-hmm. It's the word telos. Uh, it's uh, at the very center of the word, it is finished. Yes. Uh, when Jesus cried out, Tetelestai, at the cross, uh, he was saying that I have fulfilled, yes. I have brought to completion the will of God for me. Yes. And that was to inhabit a body and offer that body as the once for all sacrifice. Yes. And because his work was finished, his work was brought to completion, that goal was accomplished, then he, now as our high priest, can deliver us to perfection. Yes. The law was un, uh, could not do it. Could not do it. The law was weak and useless in that regard. Why? Because it had a completely different purpose, a completely different function. So it did its job right, and then once its job was accomplished, it stepped back and gave room for Jesus to do his job as the high priest. And that job was to deliver us to our stated end, God's purpose and desire for us. So let's dive into this a little more. So for when there is a change in the priesthood, and so this announcement of Jesus, this appointment by God the Father of Jesus to be a priest forever, is a change in the priesthood. Yes. He had established Moses and Aaron and the Levites uh, to be the bloodline for the priesthood to the people of Israel. Now in Christ, he is setting that aside and establishing Jesus is our forever, our eternal priesthood. So when there's a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So new priest, new law. Mm-hmm. Now what does that mean? Well, in Christ's death on the cross, he fulfilled that old covenant law. Every demand, every righteous requirement was met in Jesus. And so Paul would say to us in Romans 8, when we come to him by faith, when we are born again, when we are placed into the Spirit, then every righteous requirement of the law has been met in us. Mm -hmm. So that has, has come to an end. 
Why? Because it's been fulfilled. Its purpose has been met totally, completely in Jesus. So because of that, there's a new law, and that new law is the new covenant. It's a covenant that is marked out by faith, hope, and love. These are the things that mark us out as believers. So that's how, to we're, that's how we are to live our lives, not by rules and regulations, but by faith, hope, and love that has come to us in the giving to us of God's Holy Spirit. So this is good news, folks. Yeah. You're no longer under the old. You are in the new. And it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. It really, really doesn't, yeah. Bob. Well, friends, you're listening to Basic Gospel with Bob Christopher and Richard Pfeiffer. I'm Bob Davis, and this is our study through the book of Hebrews. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, just a quick note that if you have questions about this study or if there's something else you'd like us to discuss on a coming program on Basic Gospel, just let us know. You can do that by giving us a call anytime at 844-322-2742 or by sending an email to bob at basicgospel.net. Again, that's bob at basicgospel.net or the 24-hour phone line 844 844- 322-2742. Thanks, Bob. So Jesus being our new priest, this was confusing to the Jewish mind. He, he wasn't out of the tribe of Levi, mm-hmm. and absolutely nothing was written in the Old Testament that a priest would rise from uh, the bloodline of Judah. Correct. We, we don't see that in the Old Covenant, it, and yet here it is. Yes. Uh, Jesus is now a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But it's true. He is is there. Now, why is his priesthood so much better than the priesthood of the Levites? Now, it becomes even more evident when another, a priest, when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Boom. But there it is. <laughs> Mic drop right there. Ow. Jesus has an indestructible life. What does that mean for you? That his priesthood on your behalf endures forever. Yeah. The old covenant priests, it was time stamped from Mount Sinai until Mount Calvary. It was passed down from generation to generation. A priest would serve for a period of time. Then he would die. And then he would, it would be passed on to the next one. And that's what he says down in verse 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented from, by death from continuing in office. Oops. But not <laughs> Jesus. Not he Jesus. has an indestructible life. Now catch this. When you receive Jesus Christ, when you're saved, when you're born again, Jesus Christ gives you his life. Yes. Now, Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 3, and he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So, believer, who is your life? Jesus. Jesus Christ is your life. What is the nature of his life? It is indestructible. So what does that say to you about the indestructibleness of the life that you now have in Jesus? Nothing can destroy it. Nothing. Sin cannot destroy it. Why? Because Jesus rose victoriously over sin and death. And that victorious life has now become your life. It is indestructible. What does that say about your assurance of salvation? What does it say about the confidence that you can have on the day of judgment? It gives you all the confidence in the world because since you have his life, you're going to be treated just as Jesus is going to be treated. He is the heir of all things. In Christ, you have become a joint heir, a co-heir of all things. So your salvation is guaranteed. So he has this indestructible life. He is a priest forever. And it says on the one hand, verse 18, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. Now, 
listen to that. That former <laughs> commandment was set aside. Who set it aside? I'm not setting it aside. Oh. I, I don't have the authority to do that. Jesus Christ himself set it aside. Why did he do it? Because it was necessary. When there's a change of the priesthood, there is a change of the law. Jesus did what was necessary. He set aside the old. And the reason he set it aside is because it was weak and useless. The law made nothing perfect. The law could never deliver you to that place where God wanted you to be. It could never make you righteous. And because it could not make you righteous, it could not impart life to you. It just left you in a state of judgment and condemnation. And in that state, Jesus comes and rescues you and gives you his indestructible life in this new covenant. And you can ex express his indestructible life in this world today only in this new covenant. Now, he set it aside, and the reason he set it aside is because a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. You don't draw near to God under the law. No. It's only the grace of God that draws you to the tenderness and the very heart of God and brings you to that point where you receive yeah. and you rejoice in what he's provided. Think about that. Under the old covenant, you could not approach God. You absolutely were forbidden. Even the high priest himself could go in once a year. And now in Christ, as we've already read earlier in this letter, we are invited to come boldly into the most holy place, the very throne room of God, to find mercy and grace in our time of need. That's a change in the priesthood and a change in the law because now we're priests too, right. and he's the high priest. Right. Absolutely. Great point. So we're going to make this last last point. This is such rich truth. This is, this is solid meat of the word of God. But here's, here's what it means for you. So Jesus is your high priest. He has an indestructible life. He is a priest forever. What does this make him? It makes him the guarantor of a better covenant. Yeah. So under the old, you receive judgment and condemnation. Under the new, you receive life. You receive salvation. You receive deliverance. Those former priests, they couldn't deliver that because they couldn't continue in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Now listen to this, and this is the great news, and this is a verse you need to underline. Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost or completely those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus has a new, he's our new priest. He has an indestructible life. He is guaranteed a new covenant. And as a result of that, when you're saved, he saves you completely to yes. the uttermost. That is rock solid, unshakable, unmovable foundational stones to stand upon. If you're saved, my friend, Jesus Christ, his priesthood guarantees that your salvation is forever, and it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, Bob. Thank you for that. And friends, we're glad that you're with us for this study through the book of Hebrews on Basic Gospel. If you miss any of the sessions along the way, you can access the program archive through the radio drop-down menu at basicgospel.net. It's the first option under that menu, the radio drop-down menu at basicgospel.net. Now, please keep in mind, friends, that Basic Gospel is listener-supported. Your gifts through this ministry mean that others will be able to hear the liberating truth of the love, grace, and life of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and hear it every day. To make your gift to Basic Gospel, click Donate at BasicGospel.net or phone your gift to 844-322-2742. We would love for you to be a partner with us here at Basic Gospel. Again, donate at BasicGospel.net or phone your gift to 844-322-2742. Well, now for Bob Christopher, for Richard Piper, and all the ministry team here at Basic Gospel, I'm Bob Davis with your invitation to join us again on Monday after a great weekend and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.